Good morning. We'll wait just a minute or so while everyone gets logged into Zoom for the webinar. Good morning, and thank you for joining us for this webinar on COVID-19 guidance for early learning and care contractors. This webinar is being presented by the California Department of Education's Early Learning and Care Division and Fiscal and Administrative Services Division. This webinar is being held on September 25th, 2020, and is scheduled to run from 10 a.m. until 11 a.m. We want to thank you for, for taking some time out of your morning to join us for this webinar. I am Stephen Profiter, and I'm the Director of the Early Learning and Care Division at the California Department of Education. Each week, I, I, I like to focus, or in general, I like to focus on the positive and, and shine a light on the good that is all around us. Um, the reality sometimes in some weeks is that uh, some events happen. Uh, they remind us of the, the injustices uh, people of color face too often. Uh, such was the case this week when we learned that the officers responsible for Brianna Taylor's killing would not be held accountable for her murder. Um, Brianna's life mattered, and she deserved better. We'll continue to speak out against injustices until they don't exist. And as we think about justice, I also want to acknowledge that this morning, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg lies in state at the Capitol, the first woman to do so. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a champion of gender equality who is incredibly tough and we need more people with her spirit and tenacity as we continue to move justice efforts forward. And so pivoting now to um, the Early Learning and Care Division and our work. Um, last week, just hours after we ended our webinar, the governor signed the trailer bill to the August budget actions, which is Senate Bill 820. As promised in previous webinars, we started to release guidance we've had ready and we will continue to release guidance based on that bill in order to keep you all up to date. As we have with each webinar, the CDE team is monitoring questions and working to provide as many answers as possible in real time. While we try to address as many questions as possible, we won't be able to get to all, but we will do our best. The CDE teams working on and off this webinar are committed to supporting children and families. These are some of the greatest, most passionate people I've had the privilege to work with, and we're all here to support you in the best way we can. I also wanna take a moment to appreciate all of you. We appreciate all of you rising to the challenge to best support children and families, whether it's taking on the additional work of making sure classrooms are clean and prepared, adjusting your plans to serve children in a distance learning mode, or any of the myriad adjustments you've had to make to continue to meet the needs of your communities. Thank you. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to the Early Learning and Care Division's Associate Director, Erica Otiono, for some additional remarks. Thank you, Stephen, for uh, everything that you have said. Thank you so much. Um, Erica Otiono, um, the Associate Director, Early Learning and Care Division. I just want to one more time say thank you to all of you for all you do. Um, this morning, I usually give a quick update on Program Quality Implementation Office, PQI, and um, Rosan Pitts, the ad an administrator in PQI, will be giving that update. I just want to um, gi give you two quotes. I know you're familiar with them. One is, it, say, it says, it takes a village to raise a child, and we all believe it takes a village. So let's be that village to raise every child in California. The next quote I have for you is this. It says, every child deserves a champion, an adult who will never give up on them, who understands the power of connection and insists 
they become the best they can possibly be. So let's be the champions. Let's be the village and continue to do all the good things we do for all children in California. Thank you so much. I will now hand it over to Virginia Holly. Thanks so much, Erica um, and Steve, uh, for all of your leadership and, and your words. So I'm Virginia Early, the administrator of the Early Learning and Care Policy Office. Again, thank you so much to everyone who's here today. Um, my office, uh, for those of you who don't know, um, is lead over issuing all guidance um, and working with the legislature and the administration to ensure that our priorities and needs from the field are both addressed and elevated. So shortly, shortly um, Lupe uh, from our program quality implementation team, um, as well as some of the other uh, program quality implementation um, administrators will be sharing some pieces on the guidance that we've been all collaborating across the division of. I actually, I think this is the first webinar where I don't have a, a specific slide, um, but I wanted to just address a couple of quick things. Um, first of all, uh, we know that many of you are eagerly uh, asking for guidance about what to do with um, uh, children that were four years old in state preschool last year um, and how, how to sort of reconcile your funding terms and conditions with the Information and Management Bulletin 1508 with what you're hearing from your program quality implementation consultants and the CDMIS team. We're aware of these issues and are working to resolve them. Our plan is to release, um, uh, to release some guidance um, next week on this. So we don't, our update is that more to come soon on this. Um, and thank you so much for your patience as we work through uh, through this thorny issue. Once that guidance is released, we'll make sure that all parts um, are working in concert. So CDMIS will, um, if if needed, will be updated to to capture that guidance, and um, and you know the consultants will will all be have that guidance as well um, as as you talk to them. So uh, we're just wanting to to let you know about that. Also, um, we're not planning on talking about this um, in, in detail here on the webinar, but just as an FYI that one of our other management bulletins on family fees, um, we're, we're working on that one to sort of, now that SB 820 has been signed to implement, <laughs> uh, you, you probably saw that there was language in that email blast that said, contractors should instead of contractors must. That was because we couldn't require something that wasn't yet the law. And so the management bulletin will sort of change some of those words to be requirements now that the law has been signed um, and, and address some, a couple of the FAQs that have come in since, um, since that uh, email was released. But until that management bulletin is released, please follow the guidance in the email. Um, just one more quick update for me. Um, so we, I think we discussed a little bit some future webinars, um, Steve did, but just a, just a note that our Friday webinar series for next Friday, October 2nd is being postponed as the California Department of Social Services is conducting uh, a listening session in concert with um, in concert with uh, the uh, the the shift of some of the early learning care programs to the Department of Social Services, so we'll be sending out an email blast uh, that sort of says specifically when this this webinar is being rescheduled to. But um, we just want you to know that for October second, we won't be doing a 10 a.m. Friday webinar, and we will be sending an email out with more information on what how you can expect to connect with us. Um, so I will now turn it over to Alana, our moderator. Alana, you're muted, just so you know. I love your pirate hat, but you're muted. 
I thought I unmuted myself. I called in on the phone this morning, so I apologize, everyone. Um, good morning. I'm Alana Andrade. Uh, I'm a devel child development consultant in the policy office here at ELCD. And I'm, while we're, I'm going to be moderating the webinar today, helping to answer questions in the Q&A box. From the policy office, we have Danielle Cisneros. From the program quality implementation office, we have Cassandra Lewis. Mai Zhang, Richard Miller, Deer Zhang, Christina Tony, Serene Yi, and Nancy DeArmond. From our Child Development, Nutrition, and Fiscal Services Division, we have Corey Kahn, Andrea Johnson, and Alan Lynch. And from our Child Development Management Information System team, we have Rob Hom and Carly Narodahara. And as Stephen said earlier, our team is committed to being responsive as possible uh, to the questions received in our Q&A feature. We won't be able to get to them all, but nevertheless, we will do our absolute best. Thank you for your suggestion of trying to send an alert out for when our FAQ webpage is updated. We've taken that back to the team and we're discussing it. And also, until then, please just visit our FAQ website to see if your question has already been answered. For those who do best with audio information, our FAQ webpage is located at https colon forward slash forward slash www.cde.ca.gov forward slash sp forward slash cd forward slash re forward slash covid19 elcd faq.asp. For those who do better visually, I'll ask that my put that web page in the chat box for everyone to see. At the end of the webinar, uh, we'll be answering some questions aloud. And some of those questions are from this morning's webinar, and some of them will be those that we've received from the ELCD emergency email inbox. And you can always email us at elcdemergency at cde.ca.gov. We're checking the inbox daily. I'll also ask my to put that in the chat box as well. If we're unable to provide an answer to your question before the end of the hour, all questions in this Q&A box will be still captured and turned into an FAQ on our webpage. In fact, we have about 40 ready to go, and uh, we'll be working on that this afternoon. So I'll turn it back over to Stephen to review our agenda for today. Thank you, Alana. I appreciate the, uh, the, the much needed levity when uh, we are so often in a, in, in a serious space, uh, finding reasons to smile, to laugh, um, to play even. Or, uh, I appreciate that. So um, <clears throat> as, as mentioned uh, earlier, the governor signed the budget on Friday, September 18th. Uh, we continue to work on guidance. And since the signing of Senate Bill 820, we've released several management bulletins. In fact, just yesterday, CDE released uh, Management Bulletin 2018, which provides guidance on the reopening and reimbursement requirements for direct service contractors. Uh, this Management Bulletin itself is not a topic for this week. However, we will host a webinar in the coming weeks. Uh, so stay tuned for that announcement. And of course, we will, um, I, I see questions coming in um, through the Q&A feature. So we'll continue to answer questions um, that come up around that Management Bulletin. Additionally, uh, we're working collaboratively and, and closely with the California Department of Social Services to hold a joint webinar. Um, and that announcement should be released next week uh, regarding the date and the time. Uh, for today's work, we're gonna provide you with a status update of ongoing CDE guidance work, uh, both in terms of what's new and what's ahead so you know where everything is. We will also be providing program quality implementation updates. And... As we normally do, um, we'll take questions uh, in addition, you know, both live um, and some of the questions that we've, we've received throughout the week. Um, we won't be able to get through uh, everything, but we'll do our best to address as much as we can. Uh, you may also use, as Alana mentioned, the Q&A function in Zoom, as many of you are doing, so thank you. Um, Again, we're gonna do our best to address as many questions as possible during the webinar, but whichever questions we don't get to, we'll take back to address in FAQs on our website. And at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Lupe, uh, who will now discuss some ongoing CDE guidance work.
Lupe, you may be on mute. Sorry about that. <laughs> so let me start over. So thank you, Steve, for, and good morning, everyone. I am Lupe Romo-Sendejas, Administrator in the Program Quality Implementation Office in the Empire Central Coast Region. I want to start off by thanking you all for your patience as we work to release ongoing guidance. After the governor signed SB 820, we released Management Bulletin MB 2015A, reimbursement and data collection requirements for alternate payment programs and, and providers on Monday, September 21st. This Management Bulletin 2015A is a revision to Management Bulletin 2015. We encourage you all to read the Management Bulletin and contact your program quality implementation office regional consultant for specific questions that arise for your program. We've been sharing during these webinars any upcoming changes and guidance per SB 820. And so this management bulletin won't have anything new um, than what's already been shared. Just briefly, management bulletin 15A revises again management bulletin 15 as um, and has the following updates attendance records and invoice, invoices. For fiscal year 2021, that's July 1st, 2020 through June 30th, 2021, in accordance with SB 820, providers may submit attendance records or invoices without a parent signature, so long as the provider s signs an attestation that they have attempted to contact the parent to obtain the signature. Contractors must reimburse providers who submit an attendance record or invoice without a parent signature. Reimbursement for school age children whose schools are providing distance learning. Providers who are serving school, um, school age children who are participating in transitional kindergarten through 12th grade distance learning and are attending the child care program during the typical school hours must be reimbursed for services provided during the time a school-aged child is participating in the TK to 12 distance learning and is attending the child care program. Providers must be reimbursed at the certified need based on the vacation schedule. 14 non-operational days related to COVID-19. So effective um, September 1st of 2020 through June 30th of 2021, Alternate payment contractors must reimburse providers for up to 14 days of closure related to COVID-19. These non-operational days are in addition to the 10 non-operational days currently allowable. Also important to note that beginning September 1st per SB 820, contractors are required to, to report data associated with provider non-operational days for instances when a child received care from a secondary provider. This information will be utilized to reimburse providers with the 31.25 million provided in SB 820 until funding is exhausted. The team at CDNFS is revising the reports to allow for this updated data collection beginning with the September 2020 report that is due October 20th, 2020. The data required by APs for this purpose can be found in the management bulletin. I'll ask that my include the link to the management bulletin in the chat now. Thank you, Mai. Now to Virginia for more on CSPP age requirements. So um, thanks, Lupe. As, as I sort of discussed at the beginning, and I'm seeing a number of questions um, in the chat, uh, we, we will be releasing email guidance on uh, CSPP age requirements uh, next week. And so those of you that have questions about that, we would just ask you to sort of reference our guidance once it's released. Thanks, Lupe. So it looks like for our next update, um, I'd like to invite Roseanne. Hello, this is Roseanne Pitts. 
I'm an administrator with the PQI Central section and happy to be here today to give our PQI update report. Um, though you have not yet seen the uh, email regarding DRDPs, it will be out just shortly after this webinar today. We had it approved just early this morning, so it will be out before the end of the day. Uh, I will repeat a little bit about what we've said the last few weeks about it, and then I will actually show you um, the uh, preschool view. So the modified e essential view is what we are releasing for this year for just the year 2021, uh, in which the infant toddler version has 13 measures and the preschool version has 16 measures. Um, if you do have English language learners, there are four conditional measures in addition for those English language learners. We are happy to announce that we have a webinar four GRDPs tentatively scheduled for Tuesday, October 6th. As soon as we have that as a definite date, that will go out as a save the date early next week. During that time, during the webinar, it's going to be a collaboration between CDE, West Ed, Special Ed, and one of our funded programs that has been especially successful in implementing DRDP during this COVID time. We, uh, I will say that yes, I know there's questions in the chat. Yes, DRDPs are required this year for both those in person services as well as distance learning. And that's why we've created this simpler measure um, that will help everybody be able to evaluate children and then also help us come up with the data of how children are continuing to learn during this time. So now I'll share what the DRDP, the preschool modified essential view looks like. Next slide, please. Um, it is, the modified essential view is in three different domains. This is the first one, social emotional development. So you'll see that the numbers to the left there are not necessarily in order because these are the measures that have been pulled out that we are, are that have been put into this modified version. So uh, identifying of self and relationship to others, social emotional learning, relationships and social interactions with familiar adults, and symbolic and social socio dramatic play. Those are the four social emotional uh, development measures. Next, we have the language and literacy measures. There are seven of those. Understanding of language, communication and use of language, reciprocal communication and conversation, comprehension of age-appropriate text, phonological awareness, letter and word knowledge, and emergent. I'm sorry, emergent writing. And our last domain is cognition, including math and science. And there are five measures here, classification, number sense of quality, number sense of math operations, patterning, and shapes. So those are the 16 measures. Again, for English language learners, there are four conditional measures that would be in addition. As soon as the email uh, goes out to you this afternoon, then the um, information at the DRDP website, as well as DRDP online, will be live to you and ready to use. 
So I hope we've been able to answer some of your questions. We really appreciate your patience and we're excited that we're able to offer this modified view that will also really help provide how children are doing during this time. So now I would like to turn it over to Lisa Bellardi. Thank you, Roseanne. Good morning, everyone. This is Lisa Velarde, and I'm a PQI administrator for the Bay Area, Northern California. This morning, we want to talk to you about two things related to resource and referrals, and just wanted to also mention that we have a management bulletin forthcoming to you that updates management bulletin 20-07, which addresses resource and referrals and local planning councils. However, in the interim, we just have two updates here to share with you this morning. And the management bulletin is expected to be released sometime next week. So during the evolving pandemic, RNRs will continue to provide services to their community. We're asking that you continue to provide resource and referrals to all families looking for childcare as described in the resource and referral program requirements within the funding terms and conditions. Also, to the extent possible, please continue to assist families whose children are receiving emergency childcare with resource and referrals to access and navigate ongoing subsidized or non-subsidized childcare services to help meet the needs of the family. Next slide. Thank you. So effective July 1st, as the evolving public health emergency continues, Childcare resource and referral programs are encouraged to contact childcare providers no less than once a month. Resource and referral program requirements in the funding terms and conditions require that resource and referrals contact providers at least quarterly. However, during this evolving public health pandemic, RNRs are strongly encouraged to update provider vacancy information no less than once a month. Thank you, and now back over to Alana for the questions portions of the webinar. Uh, thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Roseanne. Uh, per you, uh, Roseanne, you did give us a, a great update, but there's still a lot of questions regarding the DRDP. And I'll just reiterate what Roseanne said before I call her back to answer some specific questions. So Roseanne did speak to that an email with more guidance will be released. So I'm, a, I'm assuming a lot of these questions that are in our open Q&A box will be answered with that email. Until then, I'd like to Roseanne, I'd like to ask Roseanne back. And so Roseanne, a few of the questions that we have um, are, will there be DRDPs for school-age children? Uh, yes, the DRDP for school-age will remain the same. I don't have the number of measures with me, but I believe it's approximately 20. Um, but that will remain the same as uh, previous, there are not modifications for this year for school age. Excellent, thank you. And Roseanne, there's also some questions about the uh, timeline for DRDPs. If there was 60 days or 290 days from when a child had begun, can you speak a little bit about what's anticipated for the timeline for the DRDPs? Yes, Alana, I will. Um, we previously and in regulations, the DRDPs must be done in 60 days. We have not been able to waive that regulation, but what we have said is we are going to allow some flexibility with that requirement and we will be monitoring to allow up to 90 days to complete the initial DRDP for new children. Excellent. So I'm going to hang on the line there. Hold on. So another one, DRDP one is 
about, will it be required for those children who are participating in distance learning? Yes, DRDPs will be required for both those children in person and receiving distance learning. More information will be available during our training webinar, again, tentatively scheduled for October 6th. In that time, we'll give you some more hands-on of how this can be done if you are kind of struggling to understand. Excellent, thank you. So just to reiterate what Roseanne said, tentatively, the DRDP webinar will be on October 6th. Okay, thank you. So let's shift over a little bit. We've got a, a lot of questions also in the box about um, the 14 additional uh, days of non-operations, uh, specifically cl due close to COVID-19. So I would like to ask Lupe to come back. So Lupe, there was a question about if the 14 additional days of non-operations, how we would report that. Oh, perhaps this would be one for, for Andrea. So how would we report the 14 additional days of non-operation? I can speak to that. So, hi, this is Corey Kahn. Um, oh. So Management Bulletin 2015A states that you're gonna report three data elements, and that is the number of children requiring care from a secondary provider, uh, the sum of all days of children that children receive care from a secondary provider and the total costs associated with paying the secondary provider due to the primary uh, provider's closure. So the Child Development and Nutrition Fiscal Services Unit is in the process of updating our caseload reports that alternative payment agencies submit online um, through the alternative payment and CalWORKs reporting system. Uh, that is currently being updated right now, and as part of this update, we'll provide um, additional reporting instructions related to those questions. Excellent, thank you. And Lupe, for the additional 14 days non-opt, are they just for licensed providers? We, we might have a mute. I think Lupe might be on mute. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Have a muting. Um, they are, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, Virginia, but I didn't see any provision. I thought it just said providers. It doesn't indicate license or unlicensed. So, in which case, it would apply to any provider, including license exempt. Correct. Okay, thank you. And Virginia, can I ask you to repeat the information regarding those children who are uh, TK eligible but are in C CSPP? And I know that CDMIS is also working on updating its system. Can you speak to that, please? Yeah. There's a few more questions so, in the chat. <laughs> we know that, that this is a of great interest um, to, to, to all of you. Um, and so what I said, um, just going to repeat what I said earlier, which is that we're, we're looking into this issue. We'd hope to have something more specific uh, had to send out on our email list um, and to share with you today. However, uh, we want to look at a couple more things and we're planning on to, to issue guidance. Uh, on that via our email distribution list next week. So uh, until then, just just know that that's coming, um, and we'll make sure that any needed changes to CDMIS are incorporated. You know, if uh, so that that or that our CDMIS framework is aligned with our guidance and um, also what our our um, PQI consultants are sharing. Excellent, thank you. Let's see, there was also some questions about distance learning earlier in the Q&A, so I'd like to invite Lupe back. 
So Lupe, one of the questions was, if I, my distance learning plan was approved last fiscal year, do I need to submit another one? Shall I, shall I unmute you? No, so can, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having a trouble going back and forth. Um, yes, um, th this is a new format. Um, all of them are submitted through a survey. So you need to link them. You can copy and paste from your prior plan, but we do re ask that you submit a, a, a new plan or a plan through the portal. Thank you. Okay, I wouldn't mute yourself quite yet because I had a few more. Okay, for you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so there was one about uh, where to get a copy of the distance learning plan template in order to prepare for the distance learning plan, meaning before so they submit the survey. Correct. You want, because I know the survey just goes one at a time. So you can get a copy call your regional program consultant, and you can find that on our website, um, um, the regional assignments, and they will provide you with a copy of the Word document showing all the, the questions. Excellent. And then there was also questions about, um, we do have a lot of the questions about documenting distance learning, which I, I know CDMIS and CDMFS could answer, but there's also a question about parent signatures for a direct service contractor who has families participating in distance learning. So how do they get parent signatures or are parent signatures needed on? Can you speak to that, Lupe? Oh, you were unmuted, now you're muted. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I guess I'm not clear on the question. So we're talking about parent signatures for documenting the distance learning. Yes. And I don't think parent signatures are needed. It's just a log of, you know, when, when the families were contacted or when you provided that um, package of activities, things like that, just the documenting that you have had contact, but there's no parent signature requirement. And Lupe, can I also ask you to speak a bit about our programs required to adhere to staffing ratios for distance learning services? So the staffing ratios, I'll have to defer to, uh, you know what, can we defer to, um, is Crystal on the line? I am on the line and we, um, have a we are still in discussion at okay, the department yeah, I didn't wanna. in regards to staffing ratios for distance learning services and we will provide guidance to the field as soon as possible. Thank you, Crystal. I just didn't wanna misspeak on that. You're welcome. Thank you. And so we're also getting, in the terms of staffing ratios, we're also getting a lot of questions about uh, cohorts and staff to child ratios and how our ratios might interact with the ones from the California Department of Public Health. So can we ask that someone can speak on that? Uh, specifically, when a person is returning, are the CDPH ratios reverting to as small as possible or the 14 cohort model? So are they asking us what CDPH requirements are? Which requirements should they be following while they're, they're reopening? Their local... Um, California, they put out a public health um, recommendation. Um, and so if your local has a more stringent one, then you should be following your local 
health, uh, public health guidance. But what we don't, our ratio, those ratios would supersede our ratios. So if you can't have more than whatever those um, orders are, whether it be a state order or public order. I'm not sure that answered the question, but I. Mm -hmm. I think there's also a lot of questions uh, specific to contractors themselves. And so I would um, ask that you speak to your assigned consultant if there are some things that are more specific. And let's see. Let's see if I can pull out something more interesting. Uh, so for the most released and the, the prioritization of services section in the management bulletin 2018 about reopening. Can you speak to a little bit about the prioritization? For distance learning. Um, so if we are on an agency is unable to serve all enrolled children the prioritization then takes um, effect so that they will enroll those children that have family, well, CPS, and then of the lowest income families that are working um, first. And so if you have already, if you're already providing services to a family and another family that um, is a, a higher priority comes in, then you will not displace the currently the family that is currently being served. Um, so this is just as you reopen um, to make sure that you're following the CDPH guidance on on those group sizes. Um, we just don't want you to exceed those group sizes. Excellent, thank you. So we've got some questions regarding, again, the 14 days, but more about how we are reporting the 14 days. So Corey, can I ask you to speak? So one of the questions, do we count the 14 provider non-off days based on a days of operation or on calendar days? Uh, I think that was answered by Lupe at one time and she had stated it is, um, days of operation because they don't have to be uh, in a row. <laughs> consecutive? Consecutively, they don't have yeah, to be Yeah, they do not have to be consecutive. And so it's 14 days within the fiscal year. So it would be when you were open or supposed to be open. That is correct. Okay, um, another one, Corey, if the primary provider is closed for more than 14 days and will not receive payment after the 14 days, do we track and report on the secondary provider of the 14 days only? So I believe we will only ask for uh, the 14 days, but we do need to take this back and talk through it more. So the, again, we haven't updated the, the um, online reporting yet. And this was a question that I received in another uh, webinar and it was the same thing that we need to take it back to discuss it further. Um, ultimately, the questions are to uh, allocate the funding, but it, We'll, we'll release, as, as we release information that the site is live, we will um, have information on the instructions on what you should report. So you'll look out for that. Excellent, thank you. And then can you, Corey, speak, which report will be revised? So we were planning on revising the caseload report. The caseload report. Excellent. Thank you for saying that. And can I ask Virginia to come back? There's another specific questions about enrollment and continuation of enrollment for TK eligible students into CSUP. 
Yeah, so um, I think Terry in the chat asked a question and Rob and I were both answering at the same time. So you got two answers, Terry. But uh, yeah, so I mentioned earlier that we'd be issuing guidance on sort of dealing, giving more clarity on the TK um, issue. Um, Terry asked specifically, and maybe others have the same question, about um, a plan to enroll TK age students, so students that have would turn five between September 2nd and December 2nd in CFPP. So um, she asked, should we pause enrolling these children in CFPP until the guidance is released? And our answer is yes. Please pause any enrollments of TK eligible children into CFPP until the guidance has released. So we're defining that as children with birthdays between September 2nd and December 2nd. And as I mentioned, that guidance will come out next week. Um, if you need a reminder of kind of what the age eligibility criteria, um, you can sort of the, the, the children that are safe to enroll in CFPP, please refer to your funding terms and conditions. Um, and any children that you're not sure would fall or not fall into that um, range, um, please, please don't enroll those children until further guidance is, is issued. Thank you, Virginia. Um, I would like to ask Lupe and or Crystal to come at, back and speak about how to record or document attendance for children that are participating in distance learning uh, per MD 20-17. So I believe that is, Corey, do you have a response to that? For recording attendance? Right. No, um, so Management Bulletin 2018 does have a section on reporting uh, to the Child Development and Nutrition Fiscal Services. Um, it's pretty extensive and it goes through how to report days of enrollment, days of attendance, and days of operation. Um, so we've clearly outlined uh, the different scenarios on how you're going to report those three categories to us. Um, one of the things that it that is stated in the management bulletin is that you will not be reporting any days of attendance um, in which uh, children were receiving distance learning activities. So the days of attendance that you are reporting to us only include those that received in-person care or if those people, children receiving in-person care had an excused absence, you can report that as a day of attendance, but those are the only situations that we are requiring you to report uh, days of attendance. And so for that, um, there's no real documentation on the fiscal side that we would go back to, um, to know whether you recorded distance learning activities, you know, um, in a way that was uh, ELCD wanted because there's no days of attendance that have been reported to us related to distance learning. Thank you, Corey. Um, Crystal, do you have anything to add? Um, just in, reg in regards to recording uh, those families that are participating in distance learning, you, you don't need to uh, um, have like sign in sign out sheets with a parent's signature. You just need to be documenting the activities that you're offering and the dates and times um, that you've offered distance learning services. And I just want to remind everyone that it is a, that we are programs are required to provide distance learning activities to families and children. However, families and children do are not required to participate. Okay, thank you. I think that was a very uh, thorough response and both of you appreciate that. So I'd like to invite Virginia back about the TK again. I know this is very confusing, especially since there's not guidance released quite yet. So um, yeah, so Virginia, there's still some, some very specific questions regarding the TK eligible children that were already enrolled in CSCP for this year. 
Yeah, so pretty much as soon as I saw question, talking, there were like five questions about it. Um, I've answered some of them on the, the chat, but I want to clarify. So here's what we're directing you to do. If you have a TK eligible child already enrolled, please wait a week and our guidance will tell you what to do. If you are trying to, at this point, enroll TK eligible children, please do not enroll Unless, you know, until, our, you know, until you read our guidance and you determine that that would be allowable under our guidance. So that's the directive. So it's different. So, so if, if TK eligible children are already in your program, just hold tight. We'll tell you what to do about those kids in a week. If you are enrolling kids, um, for now, please just enroll those kids that um, meet the age eligibility requirements and the funding terms and conditions. And more guidance about children that are TK eligible will come uh, in our guidance next week. Hopefully that clarified. <laughs> I'm sure it clarified for a lot and there'll probably still be some follow-up thoughts in folks' heads because there's a lot to deal with and there's a lot of moving puzzle pieces. So we appreciate you all on this journey with us Let's see. So either Lupe or Crystal, and I hope I'm calling on the right panelist for this. There is a question about if a public hearing is required in the distance learning plan for programs that are closed due to on an LEA closure. So, and, and I'll answer this one, Lupe. Um, for the distance learning plan, you are you do not have to have a public hearing for that. The distance learning plan, you will need to complete the distance learning plan uh, survey that's embedded. Uh, the link is embedded in Management Bulletin 2017. The public hearing is in regards to if you are on an LEA campus that is closed due to a state or um, a public health order re uh, requiring that campus to remain closed and the LEA authority is not allowing the early learning and care program on that campus to reopen, that is when you would need to submit to your assigned uh, PQI consultant the form that is embedded in Management Bulletin 2018, Verification of Closures on an LEA Campus, and you will need to have the governing authority of the LEA Campus sign that. And it has a statement in there that the LEA authority will present in a public hearing um, the early learning and care program closure and they will plan or prepare a plan for reopening. So again, for distance learning, there isn't a public hearing requirement. Thank you very much. Okay. So we also had some questions again with cohorts and also about teachers and cohorts so I'm, I'm gonna say the question and then I will call on who I think is go going to be answering <laughs> so if so the question is is it possible for teachers to work with two separate groups or cohorts of children at different times during the day each day so I would like to call on Danielle to answer that please Hi, Alana, thanks. Um, according to the Department of Public Health guidance that was released for teachers that are working with children five years and younger, they are able to interact with up to two cohorts of children. Therefore, they could potentially, if they were a part day AM and PM session, they could work with two. They would still be required to follow the limitations on the actual group size in each of the groups that they work with, but they would be allowed to do that. But another added component to that is that some local public health directives have required more strict stringent guidance than that. So they would follow whichever one is more stringent, if it's the state public health or if it's the local public health. So the contractor really needs to look into what their specific requirements are for their county and then make that determination from there. Excellent. And thank you, Danielle, for letting me call on you. <laughs> so uh, we have a few more questions about DRDP and distance learning. So for first, I'd like to ask Roseanne back. 
So Roseanne, there's been a lot of questions regarding the DRDPs and with children who have an IEP or an ISSP. Will there be yes. updated guidance on that? Um, in the management, in the, uh, I'm sorry, in the email that will be released this afternoon, it will have specific information uh, about that as well. Uh, that version is called Access, and that is done in collaboration with Special Ed, and they have developed an interim, uh, an interim assessment tool. Um, information is written in the email, again, that will go out this afternoon on that. Excellent. Thank you very much. And let's see. Oh, we, we've got a, we're running low on time. The hour does fly. Can I ask Lupe or Crystal to speak on distance learning resources for infants? So we provided some guidance in Management Bulletin 2017 in regards to services uh, for, for um, children or for all age groups. Um, however, there are some really good resources available in regards to providing uh, virtual uh, uh, learning opportunities for, for young children and it goes by age group. So there is, and I'll put a link in, in the um, chat um, but it is from the United States Department of Education, and it is broken down by age group. Um, and there are some really great resources and, and guidance on how to use um, technology for, with infants and toddlers. Excellent. Thank you. That's, I keep saying excellent all morning. So I'm going to ask Eric, who's been handling our slide deck, to... Um, Please advance it to the resources slide. And while I'm reading these off, please continue to get in your questions and our team will continue to provide answers. And uh, rest assured at the end, we're still going to be capturing these questions and answers, which we'll be turning into FAQs on the web page. So for finding webinar slides, any MBs, uh, the frequently asked questions, those can be found on ELCD's COVID-19 guidance webpage at https colon forward slash forward slash www.cde.ca.gov forward slash sp forward slash cd forward slash re forward slash ELCD COVID-19 dot ASP. You may also submit additional questions to the ELCD emergency inbox. That is ELCD emergency at cde.ca.gov. And a few of you were asking in the chat, and here it is, to contact your assigned PQI office regional consultant. A list of the consultants can be found on the ELCD consultant regional assignments webpage at https colon forward slash forward slash www.cde.ca.gov forward slash sp forward slash cd forward slash ci forward slash assignments dot asp or by phone at 916-322-6233. And with that, I'd like to bring back our associate director, Erica, to come and help begin our closeout. Thank you so much, Alana. Thank you, everyone, for participating one more time. We really appreciate all that you do for children and families. Let's continue to be the village and the champion for all children in California. Happy Friday. Enjoy your weekend. Stay safe. Uh, physical distance hand washing, and of course, wearing masks. Let's stay safe. Thank you, everyone. Next to you, Alana. Erica. 
And, and on behalf of the team at CDE who are continuously working to give you the, the best information at a time when um, you know, information just frankly uh, changes, uh, we thank you for taking the time out of your day. We thank you for your, your, your patience um, and, and we hope you'll join us for, for the next uh, webinar. Um, I like to close usually to, you know, by asking all of us to, you know, take care, be safe and be kind. I'd also like to add on that, um, you know, we can all work together to help to stop the spread of the, uh, the coronavirus, which is, you know, why, why we are kind of working in, the, in this way. You hear it all the time from public health departments, but please wear a mask when you're, when you're out. Practice physical distancing. Um, we'll get through this together and we'll work together to get back to normal. Thank you, everybody. Uh, just a reminder for next week, there will be no webinar on Friday uh, because the CDC, uh, CDSS has their own webinar and um, in cohorts with what we're doing. So there will be no webinar next Friday and I'm going to keep this open for just a few more seconds and end the webinar so we can capture your last minute questions. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>